Hello and welcome to today's webinar on data integrity for materials testing. Before we start, we will just go through a couple of housekeeping. So the webinar will be recorded. Uh, the recording has already started. Um, everybody's muted at the moment. Um, you can ask questions via the chat and I will endeavour to answer them as we go um, or at the end of the presentation. And there'll be a questions and answers at the end of the webinar as well. And at the end of the presentation, we will share all the presentation slides by email. And if you need to review anything, um, we will upload it very quickly onto our website and our, our YouTube channel. So myself, I've been working in the materials testing for, for a long time, as you can see, um, and a, a substantial part of that. I've been involved with many, many customers around the world, uh, focusing on data integrity, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry. So the agenda, um, this webinar will last uh, 30 minutes at the most. Um, we'll have a quick look at who we are and we'll look at some of the applications and the key part of the presentation will be looking at what is data integrity and understanding FDA 21 CFR Part 11 and then what we'll do is we'll use um, uh, some application software the Lloyd Nexigen software to give a worked example on how that data integrity uh, functionality is implemented in software so that when you're looking for a software you know what to look for and then we'll do a real life demonstration of a workflow of testing the glide force of a syringe and we'll see how data integrity impacts each step of the process so Amatech um, it's a very large business um, established long ago in 1930 and we have nearly 20,000 employees 150 locations in 30 countries Amadec test, um, specifically Lloyd Materials Testing, is one of those many businesses in the Amatec group. And our focus is on materials testing. So measuring the compression and tension forces of materials and also products and, and specifically uh, medical devices and medical packaging. Uh, we can see here uh, the force required to puncture pills from a blister pack. Um, so the tests are typically for R&D um, and quality control. And uh, the most common test is, is syringe glide force. Um, we also do a lot of tests on the pull out force for needles, the bending of needles the seal strength of medical packaging and general force testing of all types of medical devices, um, typically unique tests for unique products where we, we specialize in developing test methods with customers where they have a, a unique product where, for example, a, an international standard may not exist. So those are the uh, applications. Um, we're gonna focus on the syringe glide force when we get to the worked example. But before we go into the worked example and follow it through, let's take a step back and have a look at data integrity and the FDA 21 CFR Part 11 regulation and just refresh our memories on what it all means. So 21 CFR Part 11 defines the regulations for the conditions under which regulated companies can submit electronic records in lieu of signed paper documents. So the, the principle is very, very simple. You know, historically, we've all been testing and physically signing pieces of paper and storing that paper, sometimes for eternity. 
and really it's defining regulations that allow us to do all of this electronically without paper. That's that's the fundamental uh, reason behind the regulation. The next paragraph is very, very critical. Um, an organization's compliance with 21 CFR Part 11 is a combination of application software features and an organization's policies, procedures, IT configuration. And it is key there that I mentioned it's an organization's compliance. Only an organization can be compliant with 21 CFR. You know, software on its own is not necessarily compliant, but an organization can be compliant using that software if their policies, procedures and IT um, also fulfill the parts of 21 CFR Part 11 that are required. But what we're going to do in this meeting is focus on purely the application software and the features in there yeah. as uh, obviously the 21 CFR Part 11 organisations will already have IT and policies in place to meet those requirements. So we're going to focus on the application software, which is outside of an organization's day to day uh, processes. So what is data integrity? Data integrity refers to the completeness, consistency and accuracy of data. Complete, consistent and accurate data should be attributable, legible, contemporaneously recorded, original and accurate. And that's typically uh, shortened to the acronym ALCOA, um, which you'll see often. And on the next slide, we'll go through each of those in a bit more detail to understand what they mean. But in very simple terms, what it means is that we need to understand electronically what happened when it happened, where it happened, who did it and why did they do it? So the example below is an audit record from the NextGen Plus software. Um, we've got a description here of what happened. Somebody changed a value from false to true. What's critical here is the software is logging the value before the change and after the change. We've got a log here, the full name of the user. That's the electronic signature. So that's that's who did it. We've got the date timestamp here and the time zone, so we know when it happened. And we've also got here a reason as to why. So the Alcoa principles attributable is simply saying that we need to register who recorded a record and when. It's got to be legible for obvious reasons. It's got to be in human readable form. Contemporaneous simply means it's got to be recorded there and then in real time. We can't be going back later and adding data. The original data has to be in its original form and has to be accessible. And the data has got to be accurate. It's got to be valid. It's got to be reliable. There are the five high level points um, and there are another five points that make up the Alcoa Plus principle. Available is making sure that all that data is actually available for the lifetime of the record and it can be accessed and be retrieved and be legible to be audited. Enduring, it's got to last for the required time that's specified for that particular data. Consistent is a very key one. We've got to make sure that the data files have all been stamped and they've got to be in expected sequence. We don't want to see anything that looks out of sequence, which may indicate that the data is not accurate. And that there must be an audit trail to show that no data has been deleted or lost, which will demonstrate that the data is complete. So they are the the, the the core principles of data integrity. And what we'll do now is jump into some application software and see how that is translated into software features. So some of the key features to look for in a software. The first point here is separation of system settings. 
So user management and user permissions should be separate from those performing the test. Active Directory user management is a really useful tool which enhances data integrity, but critically for most organizations, it significantly reduces the validation effort. We need an ability to create user groups permissions and restrict access to functions. Data integrity is as well similar to many of the, the Japanese quality procedures is instead of detecting something's going wrong, then let's let's stop it from going wrong in the first place. So we can we can use restrictions to functions to, to stop anybody doing something they, they shouldn't be doing. Electronic signatures are a very critical part of this. So the electronic signatures are required for authorizing changes and signing off on any work that's performed. And this really goes right back to the, the principle of 21 CFR Part 11, where we're putting in processes to enable us to use electronic records rather than paper, uh, paper physical signatures. Detailed audit trails will help us review that process. And data has got to be tamper proof, you know, and stored securely. Uh, often an SQL database is used for that. We mentioned Active Directory user management. This is one of the, the features of a software that really is time saving for an organization. About a third of the 21 CFR Part 11 uh, requirements are around creation of users, uh, identity checks, password complexities and so on. So instead of having something in the application software, if the application software is retrieving users from Active Directory, then we know that that user has been created according to the company or organization's IT policy. So all the existing procedures have been followed. If there's any change at the, at the organization level, such as a suspension or removal of an account, um, then that account would automatically uh, cease to function within the application software. 21 CFR Part 11 has a section about ensuring uh, a certain level of password complexity and change intervals. By using Active Directory, we are effectively using an organization's current IT policy. So whatever's in place is what we are using. And if it ever changes in the future, it automatically ripples through to our software. And that really does mean there's a lot of uh, reduction in, in, in workload in that there's not an independent system of user management and password complexities makes it easy for the users because they only need their Windows credentials. So their, their Windows Active Directory credentials allow them to electronically sign the changes or the work that they've performed. So the security rights are, are separated out. So in, in group one here, this is IT. So IT manage the users, the groups and permissions. And the reason that it's IT is because they are independent of those who are performing work. The next level is we have supervisors within the application software and their primary function is to create and approve methods and report templates. So they dip, they're deploying the, the methods into the workplace. We then have analysts who are performing tests based on those approved methods and reports templates. And then we have a fourth level, which is a reviewer who is reviewing the work performed by the analysts, uh, reviewing the audit trail, making sure, that, making sure that everything looks as it should. So that's the segregation, segregation of duties that uh, you'll find in 21 CFR Part 11. So let's look at the application software um, in real life, um, and that will help us understand how that's deployed. So what we're going to do here 
is we're going to start the next gen plus security configuration and this is where we are adding removing users and altering their permissions and first thing that will happen we'll see that we have to log in uh, we need to be a local administrator and this basically means that this functionality is locked to the IT department who are independent of the testing. We've got some settings here. These are the connections to the SQL database that the IT department will use and they can keep that database secure. And now we're going to look at the users and the groups and the permissions for each group. So here we have groups. Um, we have example groups in the NextGen software. You can have as many groups as you like and, and mix and match the permissions. But these are the permissions for these particular groups. We can see there's a, a lot of granularity there, so we can really only allow permission for what really needed to be done. So this is the user management, so it's it's pretty straightforward um, and it's using Active Directory, so the users are taken from Active Directory. You mentioned electronic signatures and in this instance, an electronic signature is a unique combination of username and password, effectively the user's Windows login. And the traceability needs the electronic signatures to authorize changes and sign off work. Typically in the NextGen Plus software, any any action which is critical to data for integrity will force the user to enter a reason for what they did. So they'll enter a reason. And then they will enter their Windows credentials to authenticate and add an electronic signature. And that enables us to use paper uh, electronic records um, with as much, if not more, um, integrity than using paper. These are some of the key requirements for an audit trail. We want to be logging configuration changes. Want to log also the before and after values that's very very critical any changes to the user management new users added users removed uh, adjustments to users permissions that's all logged timestamps and in the global world we also need the time zone the full name of the user responsible is what's used as an electronic signature on any reports and also in the audit trail so we've got reasons for changes. Um, if any work is aborted for some reason, that will also prompt the user to enter reasons for the abort. Critical part of 21 CFR part 11 is to log any failed login attempts. And another part is obviously secure all that data securely in, a, in an SQL database. So we saw how we, we add users. What we'll look at now is the, the workflow in actually testing that syringe. And the first thing we're going to do is work on the test method to see how the electronic signatures give us traceability right from the inception of the test. So we're going to start the application software now. Um, for the sake of time, rather than creating something new, we are just going to edit an existing test. So to access the software, we have to enter our Windows credentials. And that will trigger uh, an entry into the audit trail. That this user logged on. And what we're going to do is just open an existing test um, and we're going to make a change so that we can see some of the critical interactions in the audit trail. 
So we're going to edit the test method on the right. You can see a picture. We're just going to do a simple compression test on the syringe. So we're going to adjust the preload from one to two newtons. That's just the load that allow us to detect when we touch the plunger. It's forced us to enter a reason. Why did we make the change? We're going to have to authenticate. So that will put an entry in the audit trail with my electronic signature. I have permission to uh, edit the test methods um, that can be removed for certain users. And what I'm doing here is I'm just approving that test method. So I've developed it. I've decided to de deploy it. I'm approving it, added my electronic signature. An analyst can now perform that test. Typically, analysts in the software can only perform tests which have been approved. If they're not approved, they, then they don't have access to perform the test. So we're going to save a template file, and this is a template which is a, an approved method where the analysts can create new test files. So here's an entry in the audit trail for what we've just done. So we can see here that the row seven changed, the preload changed from one to two. So we can see we've got the before and after values. We've got a log here of logged in, logged out. The test setup was approved. Got the full name, which is the electronic signature. Very, very detailed audit trail. So what we've done there is, is created a quick test method and we've applied it ready for the analyst to use. So now what we're going to do is switch roles and we're going to switch now and we're going to log in as an analyst and actually perform a test. And all this work that the analyst does has got very nice traceability all the way from the time that they were added to the system. Uh, the test that they perform, you can see the traceability back to who approved the test method originally, who created it, and there's a detailed log of any changes that that uh, supervisor made to the test method. So we're creating a new test file from the test method that's been approved. And we're going to perform a test. force test now. Test is completed. The analyst is going to approve that work and then they're going to use their Windows credentials and they've effectively added their electronic signature to that data, and that data is also stored in the audit trail. We also have very detailed traceability here with the software version, the, the machine serial number, the load cell serial number, so we can track to calibration certificates. We can also see with this data who approved the original test method when they did it, we can see the version of the test method. And here we actually have the signature of the, the person that performed the test. And then in the audit trail, got a log here. We created that new test and we created it from this template. And there's a log of when the test started and when it finished. And at the end, it's common to create a test report. This is very configurable. This is a, an example where we've got the timestamp, we've got the time zone, we've got the test results here, the glide force. We've got the full name, 
the person that approved that work. That's the electronic signature. The graph there. There's also a log here of the person that actually printed the report to PDF. That's also entered in the audit trail. There's a log there of who approved the method. And also there's a log that this user reviewed the data and approved it. So we've got traceability from method development to performing the test to review. And that gives you very, very secure data integrity throughout the process. So in summary, really what we want to know is what happened, when, where, by who and why. So when, we're, when you're looking for a new software, make sure you can see method approval, electronic signatures, Active Directory integration will save significant amounts of time in, in your own validation work because your Active Directory process is already validated. Audit trails are critical. What is really critical is the depth to which those audit trails go. Um, before and after values for any changes are one of the really key points. Um, and we need to look at the security of the data. Is it, is it tamper proof? The key part in all of this, and it goes back to the beginning of the presentation where we mentioned that 21 CFR Part 11 is not purely about an application software. It's an organization that becomes compliant, and it's how that software interacts with an organization's IT, with their policies, their SOPs. Um, so it does need a partner who can review all of those parameters with you, who has solid understanding of data integrity, so that you can be very, very confident that a software will fit into your processes and allow you to be compliant. And that is something that we provide uh, across the globe. Let's reach the, the end of this presentation. We're just under the half an hour. Um, I'll open the floor now to any questions that anybody may have. Feel free to drop some questions in the chat. Not seeing any questions at the moment. Um, I'm sure you will have some later on. Um, as we mentioned, we'll share the slides with you by email and it will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, but if you do have any questions, you certainly reach out directly to myself or my team. Um, and we're more than happy to go through um, the whole process and, and demonstrate the software in more detail. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, Ah, this one one question just come through. It's a very good question. Is the current software able to manage the data from the old software? Um, it depends on how old the software is. If the software is still called NextGen Plus that you have today, then yes, the current software will be able to read all the existing files. So if you have NextGen Plus, which goes back about the last 15 years, then any test methods that you have are directly transferable into the current software. Um, that process hasn't changed, but what has changed is all the data integrity features around it. So unless you have software that's more than 15, 20 years old, then yes, um, you, you'll be able to read it and you'll be able to take your methods and use them directly. The question here on the system requirements to upgrade to the current version. Um, 
in reality, to get good performance these days is, is not difficult with a PC from a system requirement point of view from a PC spec. You know, an i5 with a solid state drive will give you more than enough performance. Um, what it will need is uh, an SQL server. Uh, which any users of the existing Nexium Plus won't have. We do supply a standalone server, um, or you can use your network SQL license if your organization has, you know, a corporate wide SQL. Um, so you will need to be able to connect to that. Um, but there's, there's very little uh, in additional requirements compared to current versions. Certainly, if you're transferring from Nexigen Plus to this latest version, yeah, you'll just be able to open all your methods, use them. Um, all this does is add all the data integrity around it, so it's it's pretty seamless. Okay, thank you very much for attending, everybody. Um, as I say, if you if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.